This is Polyphonic Press, the podcast where two music fans pick a classic album completely at random. Using the patented random album generator, they are given an album to review from a curated list of over 1,000 classic releases, spanning multiple genres. And now onto the show. Here are your hosts, Jeremy Boyd and John Van Dyke. Hi, welcome to Polyphonic Press. I'm Jeremy Boyd. I'm John Van Dyke. And uh, let's not waste any time. Uh, let's uh, queue up the uh, random album generator, the patented random album generator. And uh, let's see what album we're going to be listening to this week. And the album we're going to listen to is Miriam Makiba, self-titled Miriam Makiba. Okay. Okay, well let's um let's see what this says on allmusic.com. Okay, so Miriam Makiba had just made a splash in New York nightclubs and earned a fistful of press only a few months earlier when RCA Victor Records snapped her up and recorded her first album in May 1960. Clearly, the label was hoping to repeat the success of her mentor Harry Belafonte whose uh, Belafonte folk singers accompanied her on some tracks and who wrote a blurb for the album's back cover. Like Belafonte, she was a black singer in an, with an exotic folk-based repertoire who could translate her music into, sophisticate, into a sophisticated club act. In addition to the Belafonte trope, uh, or troupe, she, uh, which appeared on the Calypso tune The Naughty Little Flea, a song that sounded like a Belafonte number, the, the Chad Mitchell trio joined her on uh, Mbube. I'm not sure how to say that. It's M-B-U-B-E, um, a.k.a. The Weavers. Um, Wimoway and Charles Coleman was her duet partner on the, uh, the comic Austrian tune One More Dance. She also turned in an early version of House of the Rising Sun. Such familiar material offset the song sung in her native South African tongue of uh, Exosa. I'm sorry, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. It's X-H-O-S-A. Makiba had an uh, expressive voice and was extremely versatile, as the range of material indicates. But despite the critical raves, she may have been a bit too exotic to be commercial on her first album, which was not a big seller. RCA let her go to Cap Records for her second album, but came calling again three years later. I guess it's a pretty radical departure for 1960. Yeah. This should be interesting, though. Okay, so the, uh, the album starts off with the song, The Retreat Song. Here we go. All right, that concludes the first side, or the first half of the album, anyway. Um, yeah, what do you think so far? Again, um, we've been having a few albums that kind of fall a little outside my wheelhouse, but this is pretty pretty kind of cool. I like that, uh, what's it called? Suliram? I kind of like that song. That was pretty good. Um, the last one was pretty cool too well and it definitely inspired the lion sleeps tonight if you ever heard that one well i was actually just reading a little bit about it and um so it's there was actually a sort of a a legal battle between that um so uh so i guess what happened was the person that wrote it uh his name is solomon linda I guess it's pr- pronounced Wimboe, and it's the Zulu word for lion. Okay. And written by Solomon Linda, a South African Zulu singer who worked for the Gallo Record Company in Johannesburg as a cleaner and record packer. Um, he spent his uh, weekends performing with the Evening Birds, a musical ensemble, and it was at Gallo Records under the direction of producer Griffiths Motsilia. Uh, Motsiloa, sorry, uh, that Linda and his fellow musicians recorded several songs, including Wimboy, uh, which incorporated a call response pattern common, common among sub Saharan African ethnic groups, including the Zulu. 
uh, according to journalist Rianne Mallon, uh, Wimbleway was the most unremarkable, or was the most remarkable tune, uh, but there was something compelling about the underlying chant, a dense meshing of low male voices above the Solomon yodeled, ab- above which Solomon yodeled and ho- howled for two exhilarating minutes. Um, so that's talking about the history of the lion sleeps tonight, but the copyright issue came. Social historian Ronald D. Cohen writes, Howie Richmond copyrighted many songs originally in the public domain, but now slightly revised to satisfy DECA and also to reap profits. Howie Richmond's claim of author's copyright could secure both songwriters' royalties and his company's publishing share of the song earnings. Um, Although Linda was listed as a performer on the record itself, the Weavers thought they had recorded a traditional Zulu song. Their managers, uh, publishers, and their attorneys knew otherwise. It sounds a little underhanded. So it sounds like uh, uh, Wimbawe was uh, the original, and uh, I guess Lion Sleeps Tonight was sort of an, an adaptation of it for like Western audiences. Yeah, it was, um, I guess, uh, what was it, the, I don't know who had, I don't know who actually sang The Lion Sleeps Tonight. Uh, I know the song, I mean, I've known that song, uh, oh, it's your, it's, uh, a band called The Tokens? Tokens, okay. When did that uh, come out? They're like a doo-wop group. Um, come out late 50s, early 60s, I'm guessing. Uh, 61. 61. Okay, so it, it's a year after this, too. So, interesting. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't, uh, obviously I don't understand exactly what she's singing about or anything like that, but she has an amazing voice. Yeah, she's got um, a great voice. Really interesting voice. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, she's, like, singing in her, um, in her, you know, native, native. language, but, uh, yeah. Which I, uh, I guess is Zulu? Um... Um, I, it did say in that write-up, it was, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's, uh, spelled X-H-O-S-A. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm not sure how to pronounce that either. Josa, maybe? I don't know. I'm gonna look it up. Could be. Oh, Ko, Kosha. Kosha. Yeah. Or, or Kosa. 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 Okay. The internet's good for this. The internet is very good for that. It was really interesting how the uh, um, instrumentation is really sparse. Like, there's not a whole lot. It's just letting the voices, for the most part, sing for themselves. I was going to say speak for themselves, but I guess that works. Speak for themselves. Well, there was there was the one song, Sula Ram. I think that's the one that was uh, completely a cappella. Yeah, the, yeah, but you're right. The instrument is very popular. Sometimes it's just a bass. Sometimes it's just, you know... Uh, maybe a little bit of strings on it or something, but yeah, it is very sparse. Anyway, I guess we will move on to the second side, and the second side uh, starts off with a song called The Naughty Little Flea. Okay, ending the album with Ia Gaduza. Um, yeah, I, this is a really interesting album, not something I would normally listen to at all, but, uh, yeah, really fascinating. And it's interesting to hear her, uh, on the second half of the album sing some, uh, English songs as well. Um, so that was, that was pretty interesting to, to hear some of the, just sort of the range that she has. Yep. Um, I noticed the naughty little flea had a little bit more instrumentation going on, but but even then it was still on the sparse side. But it was probably the most you heard throughout the whole album. There was some guitar, there was a little bit of bass, and I think there was some drum in there, just a little bit, just you know, just carrying a little bit of the tune. I also thought it was an interesting. She had an interesting take on the House of the Rising Sun, a very brief one, but it was uh, for a song that's as old as it is, and of course this recording predates the the animals version that's probably the one that most people are familiar with absolutely yeah well i think they did a marvelous version of the song (laughs) but this is a pretty 
a decent one too. Uh, definitely more on the, you know, the pared down side. Um, it just told the story a little bit. Which I, you know, I think that's that's what they say like about a, a great song is if if you know you can have the big production of like you know all different instruments and whatever, but the mark of a great song is if you can play it with just like the vocals and a guitar and you, and it's still a great song, that means it's a really well-written song. And this is proof of that, that it's, you know, it's still, it's a totally different version of the song. It just shows how great of a song it really is. Mm -hmm. It stands the test of time. It's, uh, it holds up no matter who does it. And it's like well over a hundred years old. Getting back to the the naughty little flea, I actually sort of envisioned that sort of like um, the vision in my head is sort of like a uh, like a Disney animation kind of thing with this little flea going around, you know, to these different places. And my head, it sort of was uh, almost like uh, you know the specifically the Disney animation style that they did in the seventies, like with the Aristocats and and things like that. I sort of pictured that, that sort of style. That's just what went through my head. It, it's a very visual song. It's, uh, yeah, it tells the story rather well. Um, I also thought One More Dance was, was quite amusing. Yeah, that was. I, I don't Obviously, know. so did Charles Coleman. Charles Coleman, yeah. laughing, through, laughing the whole thing. through the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was pretty cool, too. I thought that was, that was a fun little song. Um. I was actually reading a little bit about her. She's actually really cool. Like, she was really good friends with Harry Belafonte, who was um, very much involved with the civil rights movement in the early 60s. Uh, she was right there with him. She was part of that as well. Uh, but she was also... Um, so this is just from her Wikipedia pages. Makiba was among the most visible people campaigning against the apartheid system in South Africa and was responsible for popularizing several anti-apartheid songs, including Metal Lands. Due to her high profile, she became a spokesperson of sorts for Africans living under oppressive governments, and in particular for black South Africans living under apartheid. When the South African government prevented her from entering her own her home country, she bega became a symbol of apartheid's cruelty, and she used her position as a celebrity by testifying against apartheid before the UN in 1962 and 1964. Many of her uh, songs were banned within South Africa, leading to Makiba's records being distributed underground and even her apolitical songs being seen as sub subversive. She thus became a symbol of resistance to the white minority government, both within and outside uh, South Africa. Uh, in an interview in 2000, Masakela said that there was nobody in Africa who made the world more aware of what was happening in South Africa than Miriam Makiba. So she was a very big part of the anti-apartheid movement in, um, in South Africa. It's interesting. I've heard a few stories about uh, artists having their, um, their works sort of become big because they were going underground in South Africa and stuff like that. Um, and they they continue to do that even after apartheid with um what the heck is that guy's name who's he's just this poor carpenter living in Detroit but he's huge he's like Elvis level huge in South Africa <laughs> I'm trying to remember his name there was a documentary about him wasn't there yes it's really good um they called him Sugar Man I'm trying to remember what his na actual name was though. The documentary is uh, ser Searching for Sugar Man or something like that. They thought he was dead, but nope, he was just, you know, fixing up old houses in Detroit. <laughs> uh, Sixto Rodriguez. That's him. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's this, um, he found success in South Africa, but he played, um, he was like a rock or blues guy, wasn't he? Um, sort of like a folk blues sort of thing. He, 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 he wasn't necessarily what, like, blues in the strict sense, but he had sort of like a, I don't know, a bluesy 
sort of approach to folk, I guess. He is really good. But I get that sort of an aside. I thought, thought it was interesting how uh, South Africans have this notion, or have this um, uh, habit of distributing things underground and making people huge. <laughs> I just think it's cool. Yeah. You no, know, it really is. Um, but yeah, and uh, so apparently this album, um, it, it didn't go, it didn't go very well in when it was initially released and, uh, RCA sort of, uh, for her next album, they put it back to one of their subsidiaries called Cap Records. And apparently that one actually was a hit. And so they kind of reinstated her on to RCA's main, main label. Main label, yeah. So I guess it's it's interesting too that um you know if you know somebody's album gets released and it's maybe just a little bit of head ahead of its time or people just aren't quite ready for it and then all of a sudden it's the next one is a big hit, you know. Well, this would have been like very early on in the, you know, the world music scene sort of thing, um, which she would sort of fall under, um, you know, whether, you know, w- whether that's fair or not. Um, yeah. Well, there's a whole kind of thing about the label world music. Yeah, it's I know. It's kind of it's, an Americanized, it's an, it's, 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 it's a Western term for music that isn't Western. <laughs> it could literally mean anything from... Thailand to Botswana to who knows, just anywhere. Um, you could be from Siberia and you'd fall under world music in a lot of cases. So it's 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 very strange. But but the thing is, um the world music movement, which I this really I wouldn't say it was a thing very much a thing in the late fifties, early sixties. It became more of a thing around the late seventies, so this would have been quite ahead of its time in a lot of ways, for, for uh, Western ears anyway. I I don't know if if it was the label not promoting it or what, but it was like um, well, if they had it on the main label, I I would think that they promoted it a certain amount. They expected it her to be like another Barry Belafonte, but he was singing. Yeah, he was singing in English, so this might have been a little bit more of a departure. They obviously recognized her talent, which is, you know, and of course this was still the wild west of the uh, um, the record labels where they were literally throwing things at the wall and seeing what stuck. So the fact that they, it's not actually a huge surprise that they took a chance on her, um, didn't initially pay off. It took a little while for that to do so, but. Uh, yeah, that that's one of the few uh instances where I look at the record company and go, you know, good on you for recognizing talent when you see it and actually doing something about it. Even if you didn't get an initial payoff, it, it came eventually. I enjoyed this album. I don't know if it's something I'm going to listen to all that often, but I'm I'm glad that I now know about her. Um and um I'm glad that I uh I'm glad that I heard this album because I, oh, without having done this podcast, I would never have known about her. I would never have, you know, I might have somewhere along the way, but, you know, I'm glad that, you Sitting know, down and listening to the album was probably, it quite possibly might not have happened. Yeah. Um, there are some circles where I might have heard the odd song or, or so. Maybe if I was looking up House of the Rising Sun, different fi- versions of it, I probably would have come across hers. Other than that, yeah, it's 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 an interesting piece of, uh, you know, um, music history and uh, world history, and uh, she's a, a an interesting figure for sure. Yeah, and uh, yeah, an amazing voice too. I I'm mm-hmm. really impressed with her voice. She yep. really got. You know, and um, yeah, I'm really glad to have uh, to have discovered her. But uh, anyway, so I guess we'll end the the podcast there. Uh, thank you so much for listening. If you made it this far, um, 
you can check us out uh, if you feel inclined to help out the show you can do that on patreon.com slash polyphonic press you can go to polyphonicpress.com and drop us a line there and you can follow us on instagram and at polyphonic press music and um i think that's pretty much it uh i'm jeremy boyd and i'm john van dyke take it easy Thank mm-hmm. you.